What's up, everybody? I'm Yogi Chris, PhD, founder of Ninth Limb Yoga and captain of IMC Nation. I live with the founder of IMC Nation here in Campbell, California at a location called Base One Stoic Temple. And this next episode is the sixth recycled episode from Science of Spiritual Growth podcast. It was one of my other podcasts. I did over 140 episodes on it. And this was one of the top performing episodes. Not all of the episodes I'm recycling are like the top episodes. They're just the best episodes. Not always does the best one get the most views for one reason or another. This one is one of my favorites. I remember it specifically, and I've recorded over 600 podcasts. So when I remember one, I know it really stands out. How to measure spiritual growth. This was basically the underlying principle of the whole Science of Spiritual Growth show was measuring spiritual growth through your communication, your skills of communication, how you communicate as an indicator of your spiritual development. And to really get the IMC teachings and the IMC Nation movement, which is a red pill movement, it's a masculinity movement, just like in Latin masculinity, to really get the teachings of IMC, it's to understand what I talk about in this podcast, how to measure spiritual growth with your development of language. And so I hope you enjoy. It's a very powerful topic. I think it's very useful for everybody. Leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you hear me refer to science of spiritual growth throughout the episode, it's because it's a recycled episode. But this is, in fact, Enlightened Masculinity podcast where I'm recycling this episode on. And I look forward to seeing you in one of our live shows. Welcome to the Science of Spiritual Growth, or whatever this ends up being called in the future. We're streaming it to the Ninth Limb Yoga YouTube. You know, there's so much suppression going on on all these platforms. We're developing an app, and who knows where this will be posted in the future. So welcome. Definitely click that subscribe. I'm Yogi Chris, PhD, founder of Ninth Limb Yoga. And, you know, as always, the Science of Spiritual Growth, it's built on the premise that communication is your measurement of spiritual growth that what good is spiritual growth if it takes you out of harmony with people that the main influence that can be seen you know there's a lot going on in the universe we don't see but i mean what, what are we going to do we can't measure it like if we have to be able to measure it to like otherwise it's just a bunch of intuitions and you know he said she said you know when we can see it on the outside we can measure it so uh, people by measurement are more influential on the earth than pretty much everything else. Like almost more than the sun. The only reason why not more than the sun is because I don't think the sun, I don't think people could heat the earth as well as the sun does. Trust me, I'm a PhD in environmental engineering sciences. My PhD is on this. The interaction, all right, so we're going to get some environmental engineering here. So there's only, there's, earth is a closed system meaning there's no energy being input to it except you know, what comes from the sun. And it has angular momentum, so it's rotating. And that's what generates the tides. And that's useful. The tides, they create ocean currents. They do a lot with you know, sea life. Basically, life couldn't exist as we know it without tides. It also creates what hurricanes and cyclones. Why they spin is because of tidal forces, meaning the earth is spinning. And the moon is dragging behind it. So as it spins the water on the surface of the earth, it doesn't move as fast as the earth under it. And so there's a drag on the bottom on the floor, the sea floor. And that's friction. Basically, the oceans are dragging on the sea floor because the moon keeps pulling the oceans behind the earth's rotation. Okay, so that's, that's tidal drag. And that's an energy input because it creates things. It creates ocean currents. It creates different uh, interactions with... Uh, plate tectonics and and so there's another energy input is the heat of the earth the earth formed and it's hot inside and that heat is coming out and it comes out with you know hot springs and deep earth heat and magma flows and islands are built and rifts and all sorts of things and it's on a longer time scale than the sun but it, it produces a lot it adds a lot and these are the interactions, these three inputs, everything else, there's nothing else input to the earth, except sometimes like meteors and comets come and they, you know, but that's like negligible. That's so small compared to what the sun brings and everything. Now, that means that everything that happens on earth is the result because it takes energy to move material. You didn't know you were going to come for a natural eco ecological physics class right now, but you got to get these basics to get my point of what I'm saying. Otherwise, it's just words. If one were to listen to this episode afterwards, again and again, it would still be true. Like, you're not going to find flaws in what I'm saying. This is the top of what people know on Earth, literally. Unless they invented some new theories or some really major advancements, 
since the, I graduated four years ago, I was top of this. And so everything that happens on earth is fueled by energy. If it happens, that means energy was potential energy was used to make that action happen. Action can't happen without energy dissipated. That's a law of the universe. So everything that happens requires energy. That energy came from somewhere. It wasn't just there, poof. It came from somewhere. Either it's directly sunlight or it's wind. And wind is because the sun heated the atmosphere. So it's basically sunlight. Or it's rain. Or it's rivers, which came from rain, which came from wind, which came from sunlight. And, and sunlight also evaporated the water. It came from sunlight. And then the river flow is energy. And you can imagine how through river flow and evaporation, everything else happens on earth. Like basically you need water is what erodes the land. It's what creates nutrient, uh, you know, concentrations of nutrients where plants can grow. Um, you know, it took energy cycles for all of life to evolve on earth. And those energies were fueled by out, uh, in, inputs from the outside because earth is a closed system. Okay, and this is very important. Also, it should be noted that as an anagram, I believe it's called, earth is the same word as heart. Heart and earth are this, made of the same letters. And it's very close to my heart when I talk about the earth. And there was a big motivator going through PhD and, and even uh, <laughs> ambitioning. I don't know if that's a word, but if you can imagine ambitioning, like the action of having ambition and doing something with it, like I, my ambitions it was largely inspired by this idea of the earth. And I didn't know it was my heart. Um, so the earth has these inputs of energy. Everything that happens is the result of these inputs of energy. And so the earth has developed uh, these like material cycles, like the earth, the land areas eroded. And that's what basically fuels all of the ecosystems in the oceans because the oceans are pretty dead of nutrients. There's like nothing in the oceans. It's salty, but there's like no nutrients. All the nutrients that coral reefs and, sh and all the food chain of the ocean, all of those nutrients come from the continental lands that it gets eroded, phosphorus and things that, because that's not in the ocean by itself. And people, humans have come along in the most recent of times and we excavate and we move dirt around and we, we create soil and scrape off the soil. And we actually move more earth than all of the natural earth cycles combined. That all of the erosion processes and all of the landslides and all of the earthquakes and everything that the earth itself does to cycle itself and recycle its land, people do move more a lot more, like t many times more than the earth. And that's current times. I mean, a hundred years from now, it'll be even more. We have a bigger influence on the surface of the earth than the combination of all of earth's inputs right now. And this is a main reason why I became okay, I, that I realized for myself at this time in my life that it was okay to not be vegan anymore, that I was not creating harm directly but I was weakening, and I, for myself, I was realizing I was weakening my ability to influence people because there was a, sense, a certain docile quality to my nature that seemed to, to be lacking a sort of dangerousness that has – dangerousness in itself is not a negative quality. It's not a positive quality either. Dangerous needs could be violence towards you. It could also be protection for you. So, but that was, it seemed the first raw meat I sunk my teeth into, I felt it. I felt something activate in me that was uh, there before, but I gradually whittled away at it as I was vegan for nine years and, you know, did things to my body. And I'm very grateful for everything I did uh, and all of the information I had. But the ability to influence people will have more of an effect potentially on the earth itself than your direct effect on the earth. If you can influence many people, you can affect how we, how we do things, how, how the earth is affected more than if you just do it yourself. 
Now, if in the pro like, let's say you do it yourself and you influence because you're the first example, that's great, but that's not enough because this is the digital age. People have low attention. How do you get their attention? You got to be a great marketer, great communicator. Cause once you have their attention, where do you lead it? And so this talk was getting it off my heart or getting it off my chest, you know, that communication that you need to get out because spiritual growth is measured here in your ability to communicate, to get information across, to be understood, to be acknowledged, to acknowledge others and bring out what do you, how do you, or what do you bring out of people? If you, uh, let's say you approach me the first, or you call me, let's say, or we, we call and we're on the phone and the greeting is hi <laughs> versus the greeting is, Hey, the, it brings out a different response in me. It would be weird to think like, I don't know. Some people think that they can be like independent of other people. And it's weird to think that no matter how you communicate, I'm going to communicate the same way. You know, I think the sense of independence, what they're meaning is I don't want to respond unconsciously to people. I get it. That has nothing to do with other people. That's you being present with your communication. So I get that. I don't want that either. I don't want to be unconscious ever, really. That's the monk life. The monk life isn't what people think of a, as a monk because that's a failing model also that doesn't do good for humanity because the beliefs and the, the repeated habits of a person that abstains from sex only work for people that abstain from sex, uh, from sex. And the advice given to people that have sex and relationships and families from that perspective should be taken with a grain of salt. I'm sure there's a lot of contentment and clear thinking come from that line, but a lot of distortment because, or distortion, distortment. Distortment, really, because mente is mind, so distort mind. Distortment, but that's not a word. Distortion, as evidenced, evidence, right? What we can measure as evidence from abuse and pedophilia and whatever in every major lineage of religion. And I'm not just saying that, you can look it up yourself. It's gross, though. And it's not to say that every convent or every church engages. That's not what it is. You judge for yourself. But the fact that it happens and has been covered up by those people, you know, you just got to, again, you just, it's a, it would be an error to put your faith more in them than in your own personal discernment. And that's what it comes down to. You need discernment. And, and that's what it is. This is a game of discernment, awareness, discernment, and a game of communication. And so much is part of communication all the way from your body image, your, your smell, your scent, pheromone or fragrance, your musk, whatever it is, your face and eyes and sound and smile, and then all your hygiene, your fashion, and we haven't even gotten to the words. You're grooming. So much is communicated by what you drive and where you live. And it doesn't mean that you need a Maserati. It's just what you drive. How do you treat it? How you relate to your environment starts to shape and define you as a character in the minds of people that perceive you. But they have their own subjective perceptions. And this is a very harsh planet. People have learned very harsh perceptions of others to keep themselves safe because people take advantage of everybody else here. That's what we just learned how to do that. So spiritual growth is not always communicating. It's not never communicating. It's not always trying to persuade people. It's not never trying to persuade people. It's discernment and the skills of communication. Then I would add to it imagination because I think part of spiritual growth would be your ability to create that which doesn't exist 
and bring it into existence through communication and to really enjoy the absurdity and the tragedy and the beauty and the unknown of life as you know it and the most flourishing life as stoicism would talk about would be you know through discernment and positive communication discipline wisdom and learning as my teacher arash said today learning to measure your successes in life internally measure your successes day by day hour by hour year by year whatever measure your success inside is where the measurement of success and this is monk life here at base one Sto stoic temple 408 <laughs> of the imc shape-shifting warrior monks okay so let's see i think that was pretty good it was pretty brief and to the point let's see if there's any comments if you guys have anything i'll read off what you got let's see we got youtube you should definitely be liking and sharing mm -hmm. instagram so many ways to get deeper on this knowledge in the silent flute for example go to ninthlimb.com and check out the silent flute if you're a man and you'd like to join the lion's den hit me up go to my Instagram, Yoga Bliss Chris. Everybody go to my Instagram, Yoga Bliss Chris. One word, Yoga Bliss Chris. So getting it off my heart. I'll go a little bit, a little bit more. Getting it off my heart. And we got the yoga groups too. So if you're interested in yoga, just hit me up on Instagram. DC, I want you to go more on the nature of energy and how it structured itself in the earth. Well, basically... The earth is part of a solar system and the solar system is not the first solar system that's existed in this area of space. There was a star system before our star that uh, our star is basically the second incarnation of itself. The first star exploded and created heavy elements that were in a big dust cloud for a long while, billion years or so, until it eventually coalesced again, gravity pulled itself together again, created a new star the dust on the perimeter created new planets. So they started just like a toilet flushes. They started spinning on itself because the solar system is spinning around the galaxy. And so it creates this effect space time as we know it, this is how we understand it. And uh, so the solar system was formed again. So in that process, the earth co condensed on itself. There's some theories that it cold condensed. So it condensed so slow, it didn't really produce much heat. That doesn't seem to be the evidence. It's a nice theory, but that's not what I saw. And there's another source of heat is radiation from heavy elements. They decay because the star creates heavy elements, but they're not stable. So that means they, they're vibrating in a way and their electrons and protons are interacting in a way that random particles will break off. And that process of doing that emits a lot of gamma radiation and other kinds of radiation. That's like what well, plutonium is, is radioactive. Uranium is radioactive. And so it actually gives off a lot of heat. So when you have a lot of that together, it actually creates a lot of heat. And the earth had a lot of that in the beginning. So still there's radiation coming out of the earth that's heating it. So those two sources of heat from the center creates a lot of fluid and it's moving around. And the solid earth is on top of that, like a shell. And it's broken up into little tectonic plates that the magma flows underneath it kind of makes these plates crash into each other or move apart or slide apart. And that creates topography, the mountains and everything. And meanwhile, on the surface of the earth, there's a bunch of water that wasn't there in the beginning because the moon formed because another planet collided with the earth and formed the moon, a bunch of magma sprayed out into space. A lot of it was lost into space. Some of it came together as the moon started orbiting the earth. So all the water was lost on earth. But then a bunch of comets came over the next billion years and comets have a bunch of ice on it. So as they collided with the earth, the water returned to the earth. We got the oceans. I know it's hard to believe, but there it fucking is. And actually some of the oceans were there in the, I remember it wasn't, there's a, there's a, the chronology of it. I mean, I don't need to bore you with the beginning of it. At some point, the whole oceans were in the atmosphere. Actually, they were so, it was hot in the beginning. And so the water was all in the air. 
and it was very thick. It was imagine 200 times more pressure than right now. You, it would crush you. You couldn't stand on the surface. And so the whole oceans actually, it, as the earth cooled, they rained out of the sky. So the oceans, the ground was bare and eventually the whole ocean rained out of the sky. And as the earth is splitting apart and sliding apart under the ocean, actually some of the ocean is draining into the earth. So the oceans used to be higher, it's draining into the earth. Um, so the, the magma goes under the rock, the rock is sliding around on top of the magma. On the surface of the earth, the sun is heating the air and it's creating cycles that evaporates the water. And so water keeps eroding, just like any river rock is eroded. Over a million years, just the whole earth is just fucking eroded and it recycles. Magma pushes more earth up and it erodes from the rain. And magma pushes more earth up and it erodes from the rain. So the oceans get all nutrient filled and whatever life has evolved from, I mean, that's a different story, how life evolved. And, you know, so they rely on this stuff. People eventually develop cities and villages along these energy pathways, like along rivers or at coasts. You know, that's where energy co condenses, like there's tides and waves and wind and all these things come together, a lot of sources of energy versus like a desert. There's just sunlight. If it's a, if it's a windless, stormless desert, it's just sunlight. That's all you got going on there, you know? And you need some water that has potential energy, you know, but you need wind for the water to come in. So it's the, it's the interaction of energies that creates dynamic systems that life can latch onto. And this becomes the secret of money later that I teach in the silent flute and I'll teach more on the silent flute because money is an energy flow and you got to see where the energy is flowing and where your service facilitates and the, where your value is there. And I'm, I'm studying and learning that subject too. So I won't hide too much from you. So the earth, uh, the energy flows, and then, you know, then we get a bunch of stocks of energy. So then we get a forest that grows and that's a, that's a battery. That's a big battery of sunlight that we can burn or grows a field of wheat or a, a lot of fish, the crop of fish, or the jungle is buried over through a landslide and over a billion years becomes coal. And that's a battery of sunlight because the forest was sunlight or becomes oil like a swamp gets filled with mud and then just covered over and the, the organic matter comes together and it cooks when it gets buried deep enough because there's so much pressure and it becomes oil. Later, it gets eroded away and the oil is close to the surface. You know, so it's a battery of sunlight. So then people came along with intelligence and this computer and this phone and everything here, my clothes is just like me. My body is made of the elements of the earth. And when I die, I go back to the elements of the earth. It's just, there's intelligence here that comes from somewhere, a consciousness that's been going along with my soul for a ride throughout eternity. And so people came along and said, here's some dirt, here's some water, and here's some wood, and voila, a computer. It's just made of the same stuff of I'm made of. And I mean, obviously, this is more metal than I have in my body. I'm mostly water and whatever. But you get the idea that all the elements came from Earth. Nothing came from outside except the consciousness. And um, so people came along with our intelligence and started putting material together. The first tools were made. The first... Uh, you know, technology was, you know, communication really, but then, you know, fire and we started interacting the energies. The first time a monkey picked up a stick and used it as a weapon or a tool. Now we are interacting with the battery of sunlight in a way that no other organism had. We created a new connection between two materials through intelligence. And then that evolved and through communication, we could share it. And so it could accumulate. That's why as they book burn or censor, we get dumber because we're not allowed to have certain ideas. And that actually is, is dumb because more ideas gives us more discernment. So, uh, you know, we just, we build technologies and then we, we use technology to do it for us, you know, and more and more you know, we get pushed into higher echelons of utility and we use technology to replace us at lower end stuff, like an automatic sprinkler system or something instead of me watering it every day, you know, use technology. So I think that basically covers that. And so the, you'll end up being 
replaced by technology unless you have intelligence and communication, a skill set in something. And if you have communication and intelligence, you could learn any skill. <clears throat> if you don't, then you better hope you already learned that skill or, or that you have an aptitude for that skill. But with intelligence and patience, really, and but communication skills, you can learn any skill. So you're very employable if you know how to talk, right? And um, so at the people that their jobs get replaced, they don't know how to communicate in whatever environment they find themselves in. The answer is not to suppress technology because that dumbs us down. That makes us, that caps us. The answer is to educate the people that can't communicate. <clears throat> and whose responsibility is that? Whoever's closest to them, their family and geographically. Don't tell me to help them because there's a lot of people closer to me that need help. And it's opening up for abuse of that line of power because there's someone in between me and the kids in Africa that you're asking me for money to feed the starving kids in Africa. How do I know that where the money is going? How about I just feed my neighbor? And if everybody fed their neighbor, it would eventually get to the kids in Africa and it would get there ethically, but not with a middleman that skims off the surface and probably skims the whole thing, really. Like the Red Cross was literally harvesting adrenochrome from kids. That's the Red Cross. So that's probably going to get this flagged. <laughs> if I'm ever going to get censored. Damn it. I made it the whole podcast without doing that. All right. I guess I mentioned the pedos earlier. Jocelyn J, are souls old? Do we reincarnate as humans again? I mean, if I say yes, if I say no, I mean, I can't prove it to you for sure, for sure. I can't prove that you will reincarnate as a human. And souls, are they old? I don't know. That's, I mean, I don't know what difference it makes. So, yes or no? I would say, do you think they're old? Do you think your soul is old? And we have the potential to reincarnate again. I think that's fair to say, for sure. Okay. Nothing here on YouTube. Nothing on Zoom. Nothing else on Instagram. Instagram. So we'll end it there. Thanks for a great episode, guys. And go to ninthlim.com for more. Check me out on Instagram, Yoga Bliss Chris. Till next time. Namaste.